Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College again. We're going to continue our discussion on the characteristics of the epithelial tissues, otherwise the previous video would have gotten a bit too long. So, so far we have discussed polarity along with what we mean by these various adaptations, uh, the various surfaces, we've discussed what the basement membrane is, and the fact that epithelial tissues are very cellular, such that there are quite a few membrane junctions present in most cases. So we still need to discuss all of these guys, and um, we can do some of this without looking at images. So all epithelial tissues are avascular. Remember what I said a moment ago, to be vascularized means to be with blood vessels. So avascular means without, right? Anytime a word starts with the letter A, it means without, as in acellular, as in amitotic. So this means without any blood vessels. So are we saying that there, are, there aren't any blood vessels, like in the surface of our skin, right? Because that's epithelial tissue. Well, no. If you scratch yourself, you know, with your fingernail, you can even dig in there pretty well. Are you bleeding? No, you're not. And the reason for that is because you haven't reached or you haven't dug deep enough to reach the blood vessels that are present where? In the connective tissue. So the only time we bleed is if we have a deep enough cut or puncture of some sort to where the blood vessels of the deeper connective tissues in our skin are damaged. We do see that all of our epithelial tissue is innervated, meaning it is with um, nerves being, you know, the nervous system supplies it. Um, so we do see a nerve supply, but we do not see a supply of blood vessels in the epithelial tissues. I'm going to for a second skip this one for now. We'll come back to that in just a second. And uh, we'll focus on the regenerative capacity of epithelial cells and how that relates to cancer. Um, so notice that epithelial tissues, because they can divide so easily, because they can regenerate so easily, they are also much more prone to forming cancer. So here we're back to our diagram and um, I'm just going to remind you that this is connective tissue, this is connective tissue, this is muscle tissue and nervous tissue. And remember that this is vascularized, this connective tissue, I'll abbreviate that. Same here. Um, there are some exceptions to the rule of connective tissues, but epithelial tissues are always going to sit right next door to vascularized connective tissue. And why is that? Because the epithelial tissue is avascular. So all of these cells that make up this epithelial tissue, where do they get their nutrients from? Well, they need to get them from the blood vessels that are located in the connective tissue. So what happens is that the nutrients, oxygen, are going to diffuse from the connective tissues into the cells of the epithelial tissue and vice versa, wastes are going to have to move into the connective tissue. Now, as you can imagine, which ones of these cells in the epithelial tissues, which ones of these cells are going to get the most nutrients and the most oxygen? Clearly the cells in the basal layer or those cells that are closest to the connective tissue, right? So the further away we get from the connective tissue, the more and more those cells start to um, crave for nutrients and oxygen. And as a matter of fact, in our epidermis of our skin, we see easily 20 layers of epithelial cells. And guess what? That most superficial layer that you are scratching with your nails on the surface of your, of your hand, those are all cells that are dead because they're just not receiving enough nutrients. And we'll talk more about the skin, of course, later on, but that shows you that the further away the cells are from the nutrient supply, the more they suffer.
And the next consequence of that is that those cells that sit the closest to the nutrient and oxygen supply are also going to be able to divide the best and the fastest. So by nature, epithelial tissue, epithelial cells divide easily, unlike the other tissues, unlike uh, most of the connective tissues and muscle tissues and nervous tissue. Epithelial cells divide very readily. They do need nutrients and oxygen. And so therefore those cells that sit the closest to the connective tissue in the basal layer, these guys here are usually the ones that are constantly dividing. And the rate of mitotic divisions is going to diminish very quickly as we move to the apical surface. All right. And again, because epithelial cells divide so readily, um, they can also be much more prone to developing cancer. Um, because what is cancer? Well, cancer is defined as uncontrolled cell division, right? So something goes wrong in how the DNA is controlled, uncontrolled cell division, uncontrolled mitotic divisions, right? Um, so something goes wrong and the cells just start dividing um, at their own uh, will, basically. Um, and so if we already have cells that like to divide, that means that if they're somewhat mutated, they might start to divide uncontrollably. So what is a mutation? A mutation is any change in DNA. Now, think of where our epithelial cells or epithelial tissues are located. They're always located in areas where they're exposed to stuff, whether it's the atmosphere in the skin, whether it's the blood in the body, in the blood vessels, whether it's your food that you eat, and just think of all the things that you put in your mouth, the things that you inhale, just think of all the bad things you inhale. Um, so all of these epithelial cells, whether it's your stomach gut cells, whether it's your, your, um, your trachea cells, whether it's your, your skin cells, etc., etc., of all of these hollow organs are constantly exposed to not so good things, things that could potentially mutate cells. Certainly the sun with its sun rays has the ability to mutate cells, which is why we're living in a state where um, skin cancer is the highest in the whole nation, by the way. Now, one little mutation, let's say we're, you know, let's say that um, this cell right here becomes mutated, um, or has one mutation, that's not going to do it. That particular cell needs to get uh, mutated a number of times. And what happens as a result is that that cell is going to start looking and acting very different from all of the other healthy epithelial cells. So, you know, cells' membranes are made up of... Um, so a cell membrane has, is made up of two major molecules. You may recall this from introbiology. That is phospholipids and proteins. Right? Well, some of these proteins are sticking out of the surface of cells. And some are going to function as little antennae or little... Actually, let's let's re re, re uh, consider that uh, they're going to function as little area codes, meaning that under normal conditions, all of these epithelial cells will have the same area code, and they all belong together. They all recognize one another. They all stick together. Therefore, but when a cell becomes mutated over and over and over and over again, its area code might change to something bizarre that doesn't seem to belong anywhere, and it may actually develop the ability to cross our basement membrane and enter into the bloodstream, right? And now we're having a problem, right? Because this cell that is very mutated 
um, might, as it's entering into the connective tissue, divide, 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 make more of itself, and then all of those mutated cells may penetrate into the blood vessels. And once these cells, these mutated cells, are in the blood vessels, where do they go? Wherever your blood goes. And since they manage to enter the bloodstream, they're also more than likely going to succeed in exiting. And so these are now cells that normally belong in this particular patch of epithelial tissue in your body. And next thing you know, they're hanging out in your lungs and start dividing there. So when that happens, when we see that these mutated cancerous cells have reestablished in a whole new location, we start to talk about metastasis, right? So metastasizing cancer is an example of a cancer in which cells have broken off from the original um, source where the cancer began. For instance, here uh, where I drew that yellow cell and it's and um, the cells the mutated cells have taken advantage of the bloodstream sometimes the lymphatic system to go establish themselves in a second place or sometimes a third place fourth place etc so usually metastasis is not a good thing it's a difficult thing to control once that happens um, we have these days much better treatments but still it can be a challenging so since we're talking about Cancer, there are, um, you know, there, there are benign types of growths called benign tumors, and there are malignant ones. So what is the difference between these two? Well, if you think of the term um, benign, you can see B-E-N in there. So it refers to benefit or bene right? Meaning good. Bene meaning the prefix for good. Um, malignant, you see the root mal in there, as in malicious. So that means bad. So a benign tumor is going to have um, uncontrolled cell division of cells, but they're encapsulated. They're in a little capsule and they can't escape uh, very easily. Uh, on the other hand, if cells divide, 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 and they don't stink, remain constrained with the help of a little of a capsule of some sorts, they can very quickly metastasize, and um, that's when we call them malignant. So we've almost finished discussing all the characteristics of the epithelial tissues, with the exception of the fact that all epithelial tissues arise from all three different embryonic germ layers, or also called the primary germ layers. And I will explain to you what these are in very simple terms. Just want you to become familiar with their names. So we have the ectoderm, and derm always means layer, which is why we have the epidermis in the skin the ecto referring to the outer layer, then we have a middle layer, and then we have an inner layer, all right? So we refer to these as the primary germ layers um, which occur in the embryo. And so what are they all about? So let's take a look at that. When a sperm cell and an egg cell come together, they form a zygote. And that zygote, will then go through mitotic divisions or a mitotic division at first and make two clones of the cell. So these are daughter cells that are clones, right? So they, they are genetically identical. That's what happens when we go through mitotic divisions. And then they divide again and again and again and again and again. And eventually we have this ball of cells all right, this is pretty much how it works in, in um, vertebrate organisms, organisms with, or pretty much all organisms, I should say. Um, and eventually, and I'm going to keep this very super simplified, eventually these, this big ball of cells 
is going to start arranging itself in layers. And so we're going to see three layers. This is all in the embryo. So we're going now from just being a big ball of cells. And again, these are all cells that are all identical to one another with now these cells having arranged themselves in layers. So this is more or less a cross section of an embryo that is developing. And so we have the innermost layer and we'll call it the endoderm. Then we have the mesoderm and then we have the ectoderm. All right, so those are the names of the primary embryonic germ layers. So what has begun to happen here is a level of what we call differentiation. And what does that mean, differentiation? Differentiation implies that cells have become specialized. to where they can now arrange themselves in three different layers. You could almost argue that these are like groups of cells similar to what we see in our body as tissues. They're just not extremely specialized yet. Um, so I'm going to say differentiation is beginning, right? I mean, clearly we don't really see um, uh, an organism yet but we're working on it, so this continues to happen and more layers and more specific um, shapes are formed by groups of cells to, ultimate, to where ultimately you know, we look uh, more or less like this, or a frog, or you know, a tulip, whatever it might be. So during this whole process of reaching this end point, we continue to differentiate. So what does that really mean when we differentiate? What does that really mean when cells become specialized? Um, after all, don't they all have the same DNA? Yes, they do. They all have the same DNA. All your cells in your body have pretty much the same DNA in their chromosomes. So why is it then that, you know, you have eye cells that don't look at all like your your heart muscle cells or um, your skin cells don't seem to look at all like your uh, red blood cells, for instance, right? Well, if we look, let's say, at a chromosome in the human body, let's say this is chromosome number four. I'm making this up, okay? This is a makeup chromosome. <laughs> this is a fantasy chromosome. But let's say that we are looking at a chromosome. It's unduplicated at this point. Um, just for simplicity's sake. And, you know, there are stretches of DNA that represent genes, right? I'm just going to draw some. Um, one is bigger than the other. And what we find is that all of these genes, I'm not going to draw all the genes, are present on this particular chromosome 5 um, in every cell, right? Even as we get to this point, even as we get to that point. And we're not talking about haploid cells now. We're primarily focusing on um, um, the cells that make up um, all the parts of the body except for the gametes. So does that mean that your skin cells and your red blood cells have the same genes on their chromosome 5? And the answer to that is yes, the same DNA. The difference is that in red blood cells, or cells that will become red blood cells, we see that this gene is turned on, and this might be the gene that codes for hemoglobin, right? On the other hand, this is the gene that codes for melanin. Where do you find melanin? In our skin cells, right? Melanin is what um, starts to produ be produced more by your skin cells when you're exposed to um, sunlight. So this gene that codes for melanin, the protein melanin, and this gene that in the red that codes for, so this gene that codes for melanin and this gene that codes for hemoglobin, the hemoglobin protein is present in all of your cells. But it's not, both genes are not always going to be expressed. So it is only going to be activated, that is hemoglobin is only going to be activated in 
red blood cells. And this is going to be activated in skin cells. And when we say activated, we mean the following. It goes back once again, I hate to tell you, to your introductory biology class where you learned about the central dogma. And what does it tell you? It tells you that DNA codes for RNA, and RNA, with the help of ribosomes, can create protein, right? We're talking here about proteins, the protein hemoglobin and the protein melanin. So with the right DNA sequence, meaning the gene, we can make the correct type of RNA and then crank out a protein. So when I say the following in red blood cells or cells that are going to become red blood cells, the hemoglobin gene is activated, but not the melanin gene. I mean by that, that in those cells that are going to become red blood cells, the DNA will become RNA, will become protein. All right. We're not going to see melanin activated in cells that become red blood cells. So in other words, that DNA is present, but it's not going to go through this process. Okay and analogous for the skin cells. In the skin cells, you would see that DNA would make the melanin, but the gene that codes for hemoglobin, it's there, but it's not used, it's not activated. So when we talk about the differentiation of cells that happen during the process of embryo embryogenesis, we're seeing that in all of these different cells, of these different layers, and then later on in the different parts of the body, all of those cells have pretty much the same DNA. It's just that different genes are turned on and, diff and, and off depending on where they are needed. Okay, that was a very long story. How does this all relate to our discussion of the epithelial tissues? Well, epithelial tissues derive from all three germ layers. In other words, if we look at the epithelial tissues in your body and in my body, and we trace back where they came from, we see that some epithelial tissues will arise from the ectoderm, others arise from the mesoderm, and yet others arise from the endoderm. And you might go, well, big deal. Well, interestingly enough, connective tissues, which we'll be studying next, and there are many of them, every one of them, every one of them arises from the mesoderm only. From the mesoderm only. So if we pick any connective tissue in your body, let's say fat cells or bone, bone cells, we can trace them all the way back to the cells that made up the mesoderm. So you could almost argue that mesoderm cells in the embryo can function as stem cells for connective tissue cells, right? Because we can um, turn specific genes on and others off to make either bone tissue or to make fat tissue. All right, and so this then goes back to the last the slide that we uh, looked at a moment ago um, where you were introduced to the terms ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. So now you have a better understanding what we mean by the fact that all epithelial tissues arise from all three germ layers. Um, and then this illustration um, gives you a better feel of where the various tissues arise from, from which layers. I don't need for you to memorize this. This is just for your illustration, except that you do need to know that all epithelial tissues can arise from ectoderm, or I should say some epithelial tissues arise from ectoderm, some arise from mesoderm, some arise from endoderm. Connective tissues, on the other hand, as I said, all arise from mesoderm only. So this wraps up our discussion on the characteristics of the epithelial tissues.